Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever video of Let's Learn Physics, hopefully out of many. I was once a graduate student for physics and I received my master's degree in 2019. Recently I've started to get nostalgic for learning physics theory and I realized, hey, I got all these textbooks back here. I could definitely pick them up and refresh myself. And while I'm at it, why not share what I learn with curious minds like you? And I thought, what better place to start than with classical physics. Physics as developed from the tradition of Isaac Newton. All this other stuff, quantum physics, electromagnetism, relativity, it all springboards off of the work done in classical physics. The textbook I have here is Classical Mechanics by Herbert Goldstein. This is one of the standard textbooks on the subject. I didn't actually use it in my class, but I have the book because back then I still believed that buying things made you cool. So let's open it up and see what we can learn. The first chapter begins by defining concepts of motion that we're pretty familiar with. Position, velocity, forces, and momentum. Velocity is introduced as the time derivative of position. This is a calculus term. Derivative means the rate at which something changes. So the velocity is how fast the position of something is changing over time. And because it's calculus, we don't have to average the velocity over a time interval, but we can talk about the velocity at a single instant in time. Now I'm gonna introduce some notation right off the bat. This is something that you don't see in freshman physics class, but when you have a quantity with a dot on top of it, that means the time derivative. That means the rate of change over time. So velocity is going to be written as x dot. The next thing it introduces is momentum. Momentum is something we're all familiar with. The heavier something is and the faster it's moving, the more momentum it has. Something that's heavy and moving slowly can have the same momentum as something that's light and moving quickly. I like to think of momentum as how much punch a moving object has. The formula for momentum that we might be familiar with from high school and college physics is mass times velocity. And the variable assigned to it is the letter P. Now we notice that things sometimes speed up and slow down. Their momentum changes. We call the reasons for the change in momentum forces. And we write down a math equation, the change in momentum over time, the time derivative of momentum, is equal to force. Now if we play with this algebraically and with calculus, we realize that this is Newton's second law as we learn in high school and college physics. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Throughout this video, we'll see both forms of this law. We'll see force is equal to mass times acceleration, or x double dot, and we'll also see force is equal to the change in momentum over time. The chapter then similarly defines angular momentum and torque, which are the rotational versions of force and momentum. Just like linear momentum has three components, left, right, forward, backward, and up, down, angular momentum also has three components. Next, the chapter defines work, which is again the same concept we learn in high school and college physics. Work is the amount that a force contributes to motion. So if something is moving from left to right and there is a force pointing to the right, that force does work on the object. If it is moving from left to right and there is a force pointing to the left, that force does negative work or it takes away work from the object. The book defines work in general for a particle moving along any path in any direction with any number of changes. It does this by writing the integral from the beginning of the path to the end of the path of the force times the infinitesimal change in distance. This may sound complicated, but what all integrals do is they take a problem and divide it into an infinite number of pieces and then add all those pieces up. In this calculation, we add up all the infinitesimal work at every single point along the path, and that gives us the total work. From this, we get the concept of energy. Energy is just what it sounds like. There's an amount of it, and that amount can be transformed into other forms in order to do work. In other words, in order to cause motion. Energy can be stored in motion, or it can be stored in a conservative force field. A conservative force field is a force that depends on position, and if you take an object and you move it through any path and end up back at its starting point, the net work along that path done by the force is zero. 
The most familiar example of a conservative force field is gravity. For a conservative force field, we can define a potential field. The force is the gradient of the potential field. That means the force always points in the direction of strongest decrease. In the case of gravity, the potential field is altitude, and the force points in the direction that the altitude decreases the most strongly, which is straight downward toward the center of the Earth. With a potential, you can also add a constant. We could define zero altitude as being ground level, it could be the floor, it could be the tabletop, it could be sea level, we can define it wherever we want it to be. We do that by adding a constant to the equation, and that constant is called a gauge constant. We find that in systems that only have conservative forces, we have conservation of energy, and that is kinetic energy plus potential energy equals total energy, and the total energy does not change. No matter what the objects do in that force field, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy will remain constant. Section 1.2 defines momentum, angular momentum, kinetic energy, and potential energy for a system of particles. This just means many particles together experiencing the same forces. Instead of three components for a momentum, left, right, forward, backward, and up, down, there are three for every particle. So if there are two particles, there are six momentum components. If there are three particles, there are nine, and so on. If we want the total momentum, we can treat all of the particles together as a single object at its center of mass. That's the average position of all the particles taken together and weighted by their mass. This total momentum is conserved. The angular momentum, which is conserved of a system of particles, is the angular momentum of the system around a reference point plus the angular momentum of the system around its center of mass. The kinetic energy of the system is equal to the kinetic energy of each particle added up. Or if it's more convenient to calculate, it's also equal to the kinetic energy of the total mass moving as if it's at the center of mass plus the deviations from that velocity of every single particle. The potential energy of the system is the external potential energy plus the potential energy between particles. Maybe they have electric charge or something and attract and repel each other. When we add the external plus internal energies, the total kinetic energy plus the total potential energy is again conserved. Practically speaking, we model solids, liquids, and gases as systems of particles under these rules. Section 1.3 introduces the idea of constraints. If we look at what we've learned so far, we think everything in the universe is made of systems of particles. So if we just take every single particle and we plug it into force equals mass times acceleration, we should be able to calculate where every particle will be for the rest of time. The problem is, that's too hard. Practically speaking, it's more reasonable to look at systems of particles in terms of constraints. Constraints restrict the possible motion and make calculations easier. There are two types of constraints. Holonomic constraints always affect the motion. For example, if you're playing pool and you have a problem with balls bouncing off the table, you can put a sheet of plastic on top of it and that will constrain the balls to move in two dimensions instead of three. That is a holonomic constraint because it affects the balls no matter where they are on the table. Non-holonomic constraints only affect things sometimes, like boundaries. The boundaries of the table that the balls bounce off of are non-holonomic. Constraints can also be rheonymous, in which case they change over time, or they can be scleronymous, I never thought those syllables would come out of my mouth, in which case they do not change over time. Constraints are practical when there are forces in the system that cannot be specified. We can't easily express the force from first principles, but we can see its effect on the motion. There are many forces like this, such as the normal force, the force of my hand keeping the eraser from falling down through the floor. This force can change in intensity based on how hard I push down, my hand has to push up harder to prevent the eraser from falling. In principle, we could write out an equation that involves all of the particles of my hand and all of the particles of the eraser, but in practice, that's just not practical. 
So my hand functions as a holonomic constraint. Next, it introduces the ideas of generalized coordinates and degrees of freedom. Every holonomic constraint on a system is one fewer degree of freedom and one fewer coordinate needed to describe it. For example, a particle floating around in space has three degrees of freedom and three coordinates, x, y, and z. But a bead on a child's toy only has one degree of freedom, the distance it is along the track. A hundred particles moving around in space has three coordinates per particle, an x, a y, and a z, and 300 degrees of freedom. If particles are confined to a two-dimensional plane, that's one degree of freedom that is taken away from each particle, so the system only needs 200 coordinates to describe it. So when we have holonomic constraints, instead of using x, y, and z as our coordinates, we use q1, q2, and q3. And we only use as many q's as we have degrees of freedom. For example, on the surface of the Earth, we can use latitude and longitude as our coordinates instead of specifying our coordinates in 3D space. And for a double pendulum, the Q coordinates could be the angle of the first pendulum and the angle of the second pendulum. Whenever we have a holonomic constraint, we can transform into Q coordinates using math. And then the Q coordinates are treated like position coordinates in the math, even though they don't necessarily have to have anything to do with position. Q coordinates could be other things like energy, momentum, frequency, or something else that we make up just for the problem at hand. If it works, we can use it and we can develop equations of motion, equations that describe the future motion of the system. And this only works for holonomic constraints. It doesn't work for non-holonomic constraints. Section 1.4 opens with the idea of a generalized force assigned big Q. Just like a traditional force is a change in potential energy over distance, a generalized force is a change in potential energy over a generalized coordinate. With this information, we can construct a math concept called the Lagrangian. It is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. After this, there's a detailed math discussion about concepts that aren't really important, but they prove mathematically that Lagrange's equations give us the equations of motion in generalized coordinates. This may look like a fancy confusing calculus equation, but if we do algebra on it, we see it comes down to Q equals mass times Q double dot, which is the generalized coordinate way of saying force equals mass times acceleration. And because it's in generalized coordinates, we can use it for all kinds of systems, not just particles moving around. And if we come across systems where the kinetic minus potential energy Lagrangian is too hard to do the math with, we can add a gauge function to make it easier. Section 1.5 opens by talking about velocity dependent potentials. That means potential energy that depends on the velocity of the particles. The example they use starts with the potentials for electric and magnetic fields, writes the potential energy equation using these potentials, uses Lagrange's equations, and derives the force of electromagnetism is equal to the charge times the electric field plus velocity cross product magnetic field, which is an equation that you learn in college physics too. As a side note, the physics we learn in college is about equations that are already known and we put them to use to solve problems. Graduate level physics like this is more about how we derive the equations in the first place. The second part of the section talks about energy loss to dissipative forces, like friction or air resistance. When this happens, Lagrange's equations no longer have zero on the left side, but have the dissipation force on the left side. And of course, it can also be written in generalized coordinates. The dissipation function, script F, is treated mathematically like a potential, but instead of potential energy, it's the amount of energy leaving the system. Section 1.6 summarizes the chapter and then gives examples of using generalized coordinates. We've talked about how to treat holonomic systems with applied forces derivable from potentials and workless constraints. We can construct kinetic energy and potential energy out of generalized coordinates, Q's, use them to construct the Lagrangian, plug them into Lagrange's equations, and voila! we've discovered the equations of motion for the system. So let's look at the four example systems talked about in the book. 
The first is a single free particle moving in one dimension. It can move left and right, so the Q, the generalized coordinate, is x. Potential energy is one half times its mass times its velocity squared, or x dot squared. The potential energy is unknown. When we take the relevant derivatives and plug them into Lagrange's equation, we get this, which simplifies to force is equal to mass times x double dot, or force is equal to mass times acceleration. Example two, we have a particle in three-dimensional space using polar coordinates. Instead of x, y, and z, we give it q coordinates of distance from the axis r, theta, angle around the axis, and z, its height. When we go through the song and dance of Lagrange's equations, we end up with torque is equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration, which is another equation we learn in physics one. Example three is a pulley with weights on both sides. There's only one generalized coordinate here. It is the height of one weight. That's the only coordinate we need because the other weight is connected to it. If the first one moves, the second one also moves. That's the constraint. The potential energy is gravitational. The kinetic energy is traditional kinetic energy. Both of them are described in terms of the height of the first block. When we do Lagrange's equations, we end up with an equation of motion that looks like this, which probably looks strange to you, but basically it's saying that the two weights accelerate slower than they would if it was just one weight falling. Example four, we have an infinitely long wire that's rotating. The generalized coordinates are distance from the axis and angular velocity, so the speed of rotation. The speed is a coordinate, not a derivative of the coordinate. And after putting it through Lagrange's equations, we find out that the bead will accelerate away from the axis of rotation faster the farther away it gets. This is centrifugal force. If something is free to move on an object that is rotating, it's going to be flung away from the axis. Now you might think, hold on, centrifugal force is only a fictitious force. And it kind of is. But more accurately, centrifugal force is a generalized force. It's a force you get when you treat angular velocity as a coordinate, not as a velocity. That is the beauty and the power of generalized coordinates. We can use the same math to solve all kinds of diverse and complex problems. And that's chapter one. Let me know if this was interesting to you and if you'd like to see more. I imagine I'll at least do a few more videos like this because this is interesting and exciting to me. If you have thoughts or questions, feel free to discuss them in the comments. If you think this is valuable, there's ways to support me in the description. I'm also writing a science fiction novel, so if you want more information on that, you can check the link in the description and you can sign up for my monthly newsletter. That's it for this video. Subscribe and hit the bell if you want to be notified when I do chapter two. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.